week will also be communion. Normally we celebrate that today, next week, but we're going to do it next week. And so make your plans and come and be a part of us. Also, thank you for your kind condolences on behalf of the death of my daughter. And I am deeply appreciative. Pass those same condolences on to my son, James, and his mother, Lisa. So, good to be with you today. What shall we do? We need to pray. Let us pray. And now, Lord, uphold me as I have privilege to uplift thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we introduced last week, into the month of September, and we are into this wonderful series called Through the Wilderness. So specifically, last week, is we had the institution of Passover, and now we're ready to move out. Slaves becoming free men and women and children. How will we respond? Well, we'll remember what it was like to be free in our slavery. And yet, now we have no longer the masters and overseers. We just have covenant with God and with each other. It's its own form of slavery, and yet we don't call it slavery as bad. We call it good. Now, going through the desert. And the scripture today, primary scripture today, comes from Exodus chapter 14. And we begin with verse 19. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the sons of Israel to march on. For yourself, raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and part of it, and excuse me, and part it for the sons of Israel to walk through the sea on dry ground. I, for my part, will make the heart of the Egyptians so stubborn that they will follow them. So shall I win myself glory at the expense of Pharaoh, a 
of all his army, his chariots, his horsemen. And when I have won glory for myself at the expense of Pharaoh and his chariots and his armies, the Egyptians will learn that I am the Lord. All right. Israel has left Egypt. 300,000, 400,000, 500,000, a million. We're not told how many was in the entourage, but it would stretch out for miles and miles. And just a bit like an accordion, just about the time that, that the first people got there, the others would come in and compress and be just about time to leave. The Bible doesn't speak a lot about those kinds of events. But one thing is sure, they took the only road out of town that would lead to a dead end. And they reached it. And wouldn't you know it, Pharaoh had a change of heart and says, said, who had, he who had just said, let, I'm going to let these people go. Now it says, I'm going to go get them and I'm going to kill them and I'm going to enslave them and by golly, no one can do this to me. I am Pharaoh, which is another way of saying I am God. I am the son of Ra. I am God. And so Pharaoh came after him. And pretty soon the, the word came that Pharaoh was coming. And panic began to go through the community. Now, Scripture says that by day they were led by a cloud, and by night they were led by a pillar. Now that pillar of fire moves to the rear guard. Not going to allow Pharaoh to come any closer. But at the same time, that pillar is going to say, move forward, move forward, move forward. Come on, move forward. Pharaoh, you stay, you stay, you stay. Move forward, move forward. People are crying. Why'd you bring us out here to die? Isn't it ironic that we seem to always have to pass through portal that seems like it's going to kill us. Why should I give up my, my life without God? Why should, should I give up treating the neighbors if they don't matter? Why do I have to give up being stubborn, obstinate? Why? Because God asks us to. God says, I will bless you, and now you will become a blessing, and in order to become a blessing, these are just characteristics that you need to give up. And we'll replace them. So we'll replace not caring about the neighbor with we'll love the neighbor as we love ourselves. We'll figure out a way to love the enemy, pray for them that are using us and spitefully using us. It's a journey. And as we go into that decision-making process, we're traveling in and through a desert. We're leaving what we will come to call slavery and moving into freedom. Now, we've always had the freedom of choice, but generally, there are times that someone takes it away. And then we have no more freedom except the freedom that we have within ourselves. And sometimes, slavery even roads and dilutes that. So here we are, Pharaoh's coming, why'd you bring us out here to die? We got this sea in front of us, it's probably 2,000 feet deep. And God says, no, I'm going to send an east wind and you're going to discover just how shallow it is. As a matter of fact, when you walk into the sea, it's going to seem as if you're walking on dry ground. Now, whether it was completely dry or not, it's irrelevant to me. You can pick and choose whichever you like. And if you want to choose dry ground and you say, wait a minute, Keith, you, you, you don't care. Call me a heretic. It's all right. But it gave them courage. God says, Moses, hold up your staff. See, God always invites us. And then God leaves it up to us to decide what we're going to do. So here we are. Our freedom is being challenged. We've just been celebrating how free we are. Now it's being challenged. And do we stay? Do we go back? Do we go forward? Always a decision has to be made. 
And sure enough, they decide to go forward. And they start marching through the sea. And the way they remember it is that there are walls of water around them. And they're walking on dry ground. Okay. Who about to say it didn't happen? But as they get through, all of a sudden, here comes Pharaoh. That pillar that has been guarding our rear disappears, and here comes Pharaoh. Because ostensibly, God has a plan. In God's universe, it can be no one else but God. So all the other gods are false gods, wannabe gods. And Pharaoh was one of those, according to the creation of the universe. So here comes God chasing after God's people to enslave God's people so that God's people will now be Pharaohs or God's people. Enslaved, to do what Pharaoh dictates. Now God has said, Here's what you're signing on to. And if you come into the covenant, this is what you're agreeing to. Blessed to be a blessing. And in that case, you will be enslaved to these principles. Be dedicated to these principles. However, God won't change God's mind. And Pharaoh just acts on whims. Kind of the distinction between almightiness and everything else. So, Pharaoh enters into, enters into the water. Just about that time, the east wind stops blowing. I don't know if there's a west wind or not, but the water just comes back. And now Pharaoh, with the metal chariots and the heavy horses and the, and the soldiers dressed in metal, they bog down. They can't go. And panic ensues and they all drown. Now this is one of the fun things, is that in Cecil B. Mill's Ten Commandments, with remember Chuck Keston and Neil Brenner, Pharaoh is on the shore and watches his command drown. In the Bible, Pharaoh goes to. What does water mean? Chaos, death, it's parted. And then here comes the chaos and death all over again. It seems as if we choose to live, we all ways must pass through some portal of death. At Passover, we mark our houses with the blood of a lamb. The lamb, the sacrifice that we might be spared always seems to be a death. But instead of it being an end, it is a beginning. It's an invitation to a new life. So we can get all bogged down into God destroyed Pharaoh. And what does that mean? Well, that's only part of the bookend. Yes, it happened. The other bookend is the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus says, they don't have to die. I do. The Israelites were saying, those Egyptians got to go. The Egyptians were saying, those Israelites got to go. But Jesus says, they don't have to go. I do. And in this act of selflessness, they will come to know the heart, the soul, the mind, and the strength of God. And they themselves will come to know more fully what it means to be a blessing as they have been blessed. It is a fascinating, fascinating thought. The story of going through the sea points to another very important fact. And that is, when we find ourselves sunk when we find ourselves at the end, when we find ourselves with no alternatives, we always have one left. And that is, with the help of God, by turning to God, we discover freedom. Freedom is possible, always with a cost, yet possible. Moses lifted his, his rod 
the people start marching through. They trusted that they could get through. Whether they spent a lot of time thinking about it, it was better than any other alternative that was available to them. Some of those, I think, would have stood on the sidelines and watched others go and say, well, golly, they're making it. I guess I can too. It required a response. Freedom is possible in trying times. The good news is that God is with us. When we face insurmountable barriers, God is with us to, to hope and to persevere. You remember what Jesus' name means? He shall save. It's another way of saying, Emmanuel, God is with us. God is with us to offer us salvation. God offers we accept. God invites and we respond. So, what are you willing? What are you willing to stretch out so that God can work with you and from you? What am I willing? What are we willing? It's not too difficult to describe the wilderness. Humans and humanity, the humans. The incapacity, the willing, the seemingly incapacity of, of any of us to love our neighbors, we love ourselves. The willingness to discover that yet again, the covenant of God, the gospel of God, is now being attacked as, and ridiculed as, as stupid. We hear the indictment that, that the church is racist. I'm not here to argue that the church does not have some racism, but I am here to argue that the church cannot be racist unless it deviates from its core teachings. And we, what do we say about them? Clearly, there are those out there that, that if we disagree with them, call us the enemy and commit to bringing us under the yoke of slavery to submit to their rights and forgetting our right. That happens towards us. That happens from us. It is fascinating. That's a wilderness. How shall we respond? What are we willing to stretch out so that God can work within us? Are we willing to stretch out our hand are we willing to stretch out our resources? Are we willing to stretch out our security? Are we willing to stretch out our worldview, our belief that only people who look like us and sound like us and believe like we believe can be neighbors, can be friends, can be followers of God? Are we willing to stretch out ourselves so that God can bless our efforts and transform us and therefore transform the world into a garden of Eden, into a place or state where everyone is not only welcome at the table, but even diversity is celebrated. For the most important thing is not necessarily what we believe, but why we believe it and how can we be held accountable to implement it. And when that involves being neighborly, that simply means we know how we like to be treated and therefore that's how we treat others because that's being neighborly. And that transformation happens individually and it happens corporately and it becomes systemic transformation.
And we get to the other side. And we see that we are saved. Saved for a purpose. Paul talks about it this way in Romans 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything. Others eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? Let their masters take care of that. You, be upheld by the Lord. And celebrate that the Lord is upholding them. We do not live to ourselves, said Paul. We do not die to ourselves. So if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. And the only other option is not to do that unto the Lord. But with the Lord, there is hope. And there is trust. And there is confidence. For to this end Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So quit passing judgment on your brother or sister. Quit despising your brother and sister. Treat them as God has treated you. And when all comes to pass, let us bow at the knee in humility and privileged servitude unto holiness and unto righteousness. The gospel today takes up this same mantra. What does it mean to be the people of faith? What does it mean to have a, having passed through the waters? What is our responsibility? Peter steps up to the place and said, Lord, how many times does we forgive somebody? Seven times? And Jesus said, how about 70 times 70? Three different translations there. Seven times seven, seven times 70, or 70 times 70. I like the big one. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to forgiveness. So he told them a parable. And in the parable, a lender has come to the lender and said, give me my money. And the man says, I can't do it. I don't have any... May I have a little more time? Just a little compassion? And amazingly, the lender said, okay, your debt is free. You owe me nothing. So, so grateful and so helpful was, was the, the lendee that he immediately went out and found someone who owed him money and says, you've got to give it to me now. And the man that he said that to gave exactly the same reason to this one who had just been forgiven his debt is the one who had forgiven, been forgiven his gift told his lender to receive forgiveness. And the man said, no, owe it to me now, I'm going to throw you in jail. Jesus said, that man is lost. He received the blessing but would not bless. He was lost. He was lost to the covenant. The man who had originally forgiven him the debt found him and said, is this true? He says, yes. He said, okay, you're going to jail. The way that you treated your neighbor has described the kind of treatment as a neighbor you desire. Now, I'm pretty sure that there was some objection to that. But I'm also very sure that the objection was overcome and not sustained. In chapter 15, Moses sings a song of, of, of victory and pictures God as a conqueror. It sets the stage that we're going to be a conquering people because we're going to go into the promised land and we're going, to, we're going to cast out the Canaanites. And then we're going to keep at bay all the other nations that are surround us. And that's okay. 
sometimes even necessary. But the more important enemy to conquer is not them out there. It's the me in here. We can give ourselves a reason for being inhumane. But that's all they are. Rationalization. We always stand at that juncture. God has forgiven us. God has loved us. God has shown us mercy. God has, has shown us compassion. And our option is to either offer those same gifts or to withhold them. Will we, will we be more than conquerors? When trial comes, will we be the ones who say, why'd you bring us out here to die, Lord? Or will we hold on to faith, even in the midst of trial? Hold on to faith through suffering. Hold on to faith until the light begins to shine once more. It isn't about who is defeated, but who endures. So, we have been released. We have marched forth with great joy and triumph, only to discover that there's this chaos in front of us called the Sea of Reeds. And we got the old bear chasing us down. What's that old expression? If, if the bear is chasing us, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. That old bear is coming down. And through the chaos, God leads us. Now we're through. The word's out that we're heading to the mountain of God. It is there. We know that the law is given, the Ten Commandments. And we know that there's rebellion in the camp. But that's next week. As we once again face death and destruction. But we are sent to the wilderness. We thought we'd already been there. Yes, we're going again. And so, where do we stand? We're through the water. We've expressed humility in the face of victory. And we've decided that it's worth cultivating in the real world in which we live. Recognizing that such humility embraces the truth. That we are still wandering through the wilderness. Walking through the waters. Hearing again the privilege of being the people. That leads us to this. Nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer to thee. What's the alternative? Farther, my God, to thee. Farther from thee. Today, thank goodness that we are making the decision to be nearer to God. David?
my God to you, nearer to you. I'll bear the cross of Christ as Christ calls me to do. And pray each day anew, nearer my God to you. When I'm wandering, as Jacob did, and in the deepest night, the path is hid. My dreams will bring me to nearer my God to you. Let Jacob's ladder fill the sky above, and angels carry down the faith and love to keep this goal in view, nearer my God to you. Then waking from the night to morning, place. 